your pain inside Cause no one will understand The last thing this lost world needs Is someone I'm trying to be The truth that has set me free Is that I'm just a broken woman Feel free to stand up for this one. I know you guys know this one, maybe. <laughs> yes. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live free. 
Amen. Are we with us? All right. Anthony Gross. Oh, we got something else? Oh, the children have to go. Yes. Children are released for Children's Church. And Anthony Gross is here to teach us about grown up right. children. All right. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. All right. Beautiful children's. Thank you, children's ministry. Bless you, kids. Okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I too want to pray this morning, God, and I want to thank you for your heart, for your love. I want to thank you for your ministry to us, Jesus. Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, I want to thank you that you cared about us so much. I want to thank you that you made a plan for us. I want to thank you that you are God, your way is holy, your way is pure. Uh, your thoughts are higher than our thoughts, God, and your ways are higher than our ways, Lord. Thank you for reaching out and saving us from this world, saving us from the destruction and the devastation and the false teaching of this world. Thank you, God, for giving us this book, this Bible, God, that explains to us and tells us about you and your image, Father, your nature, and how we are recreated and reborn, God, in the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this book, God, will guide us and lead us and father thank you so much God that you love every sinner on this earth you love every man woman and child on it, this earth God you love the sinner and you hate the sin and father we thank you and praise you God that you are merciful that you are filled with grace that you honor us God with an opportunity to know you and the literal presence father to have you to have the opportunity to have you send the comforter to live inside of our hearts. Father, we thank you and we praise you for that blessing and that gift today. And God, please show us, please gently and, and strongly encourage us, God, as you show us the ways of your word. Father, these chapters in Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 are difficult, God. They're more of our part in your kingdom, Father. And we need help, Lord, when we hear you to guide us and direct us and to tell us how we should live. Please be merciful to us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, God's standard for faithfulness. Today we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, 1 through 7. We have made it through chapter 4. It's been a blessing. Last week, chapter 4, um, we talked about um, patterns and principles for members of the church. This week, it's going to get a little heavier. We're into, uh, this title is called uh, God's Standards for Faithfulness. And I'm thankful for the songs that were sung today as well. The Comforter has come. And God, your love is everywhere. And I want to remind you today to remember as we delve deeper into Ephesians, it's why that God gave me that in prayer. God loves every sinner, and he hates the sin. And we as humans have a hard time being told what we should do. But in the presence of the Holy Spirit, something that was established last week, and it was sung about today, and something that's being established is the Comforter has come. And Brother Roy announced last week, it's day of Pentecost. You know, that is the most beautiful thing. It's also a very challenging episode. Because when you come to Jesus Christ, God is establishing a series of events that happen. You exit the world because you know that it's wrong. You are a child of God. You invite Jesus in, and the Holy Spirit who came, the Comforter has come, the day of Pentecost, he now is allowed to come and live inside you. And last week we learned that something very critical, that he is a person. We named up a dozen or more ways that he interacts with you as a person. His thinking, his caring, his intellect, more than a dozen scriptures that called out his 
personal ways that he addresses you. He lives in you now. He lives in you now. And God is calling us to the standards of faithfulness. We're not perfect. We are sinners. And God is now, the, the last three chapters of Ephesians are God telling us how he expects us to live. And one of the, I want to close with the last important thing that we learned last week was that now that he's living in us, now that this great challenge is upon us to change our life and be recreated in the image of the one, we are not to grieve him. And you'll understand when you read the Bible today, when you hear the scriptures, that these things grieve him. We may think they're normal. We may love some of these things. We've grown up in the world to adapt to sin. But sin grieves the one who is now living inside of you. Amen? And you have to grow up into adulthood, into Christ, and understand that he loves the sinner and hates the sin. Amen? And this is our goal, is to grow up and to recognize sin and to honor the fact that it doesn't please the Holy Spirit of God. I heard something this week in preparation for this, very simple, and one of our own congregation had put this out, and it said this, if you want to help someone, tell them the truth. If you want to help yourself, tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear. If you want to help someone, you tell them the truth. And that stuck with me because we're getting into the depth of Ephesians now. This is God telling us how we should live. Some of us can be very rough on the edges about being told, even by God, about how to live. Ephesians 5, 1 through 7. Let's read it together. Ephesians chapter 5, 1 through 7. Therefore... Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints." And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Amen. Amen. Okay, church, let's get into it. 5, chapter 1. Chapter 5, verse 1. It's subtitled, Be Imitators of God. And the verse simply reads, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. That is our first directive. Be imitators of God. The Christian has no greater calling or purpose than that of imitating the Lord. That is the very purpose of sanctification, growing in likeness to the Lord while serving Him on this earth. The Christian life is designed to reproduce godliness as modeled by the Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. It is in His image that believers have been recreated through the new birth. As God's dear children, Believers are to become more and more like their Heavenly Father. Keep in mind, these are not abstract verses from the Old Testament. These are direct revelatory instructions for the Christian life from the New Testament, from the book of Ephesians, which is one of the most foundational books on Christian living that was ever written. Amen? These are your and my directives. Let's take a look at 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16 reads, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. 
But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The first three were one, the burnt offering, Leviticus 1, 1 through 17, depicting Christ's perfection. Two, the grain offering, Leviticus 2, 1 through 16, depicting Christ's total devotion to God in giving his life to please the Father. See, you are to imitate him. The whole purpose of sanctification is for you to imitate your Lord. Two was the grain offering depicting Christ's total devotion to God in giving his life to please the Father. Amen? And three, the peace offering. Leviticus 3, 1 through 17, depicting his peacemaking between God and men. Hallelujah. All three of these were a soothing aroma to God. The other two offerings commanded the sin offering, Leviticus 4, 4, 1 through 5, 13, and the guilt or trespass offering, Leviticus 5, 14 through 6, 7, these were repulsive to God. Because they, although they depicted Christ, they depicted Him as bearing sin. In the end, when total redemption was accomplished, the whole entire work of God Please the Heavenly Father emphatically. Amen? Jesus' work pleased the Heavenly Father emphatically. The totality of the work. Even the first three that were the aroma and the last two that depicted Him as bearing our sin. God was repulsed by the fact that His Son would bear our sin. And the totality of the work emphatically pleased God. Amen, church? He was pleased to give His Son for us. We are charged with imitating the Lord. Verse 3. Verse 3 reads, Ephesians 5, verse 3, But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Immorality and greed. In absolute contrast to God's holiness and love, such sins as these do exist. By which Satan seeks to destroy God's divine work in his children and turn them as far away as possible from his image and his will. As do many other scriptures, this verse shows the close connection between sexual sin and other forms of sin, of impurity and greed. An immoral person is inevitably greedy. Such sins are so godless that the world should never have reason to suspect their presence in Christians. I'm going to read that again. Such sins are so godless that the world should never have any reason even to suspect their presence in Christians. That is a tall order for us. We need the Holy Spirit to help us. Amen? Verse 4. Ephesians 5 verse 4 reads, And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Not fitting. These three inappropriate sins of the tongue include any speech that is obscene and degrading or foolish and dirty, as well as suggestive and immoral. All such are destructive of holy living and godly testimony, and they should be confessed, forsaken in truth, and replaced by open expressions of thankfulness to God. Amen, church. Let's work on this together. We're in the heart of it right now. These sins should be confessed, forsaken in truth, and replaced by open expressions of thankfulness to God. Let's take a look at Colossians 3, 8 through 10. Colossians 3, 8 through 10 says, But now you also put them all aside. 
anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created him. You are being recreated as the Comforter comes to live in you, and we celebrate Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, the challenge is that you are being recreated in His image. Amen? That is the work of God. That is the will of God. We may have trouble. We may stumble. We may not know that God, with salvation, comes these directives to live to please the Father. It's not easy. Verse 5. Verse 5 reads, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Going a little deeper. For this you know. Paul had taught this truth many times when he pastored the church at Ephesus, and it should have been clear in their minds. God never tolerates sin, which has no place at all in his kingdom, nor will any person whose life pattern is one of habitual immorality, impurity, and greed. nor one like this be in his kingdom, because no such person demonstrates salvation. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 reads, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. The purpose of sanctification, we started out to cause and increase you to live in the image of the Lord. The reason the Bible states these things is because God knows that we are perverted by the world. And he tells us, as I recreate you, it wouldn't be new if he didn't give us new beginnings and new teachings and new qualifications to live up to his standards. You can be saved, but the Bible says, do not what? To who? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And we just grieve Him, we hurt Him, we come along together. And in love, God loves the sinner. And He hates the sin. And I think this is where people stumble. I think this is where the most confusion is laid out in the world. All sins are the same. God does not tolerate sin. Christians become confused about that. They recreate God in their image. You are to be created in His image. You are to forsake the sin and get help and get love and be loved upon and change your life and encourage one another and know above all else that God loves every sinner. God died for every single person. Christ sacrificed His life and gave Himself as a fragrant offering for anyone and every human being that will come to Him and have a new life. Amen? Lastly, in verse 5, inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. This is a reference to the sphere of salvation where Christ rules the redeemed. That's where we live. The sphere of salvation where Christ rules the redeemed. This is where we shall live with Him forever. Amen? And we will do it in His image. He will not do it in our image. Amen, church? Amen. Lastly, verse 6 and 7. Ephesians 5, 6 and 7 reads, 
Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Do not be deceived with empty words. No Christian will be sinless in this present life. So let's just establish that again. Something we talk about often. As long as we're here in our unredeemed flesh, Christians will still sin. Amen? Understand that. But it is dangerously deceptive for Christians to offer assurance of salvation to a professing believer whose life is totally characterized by persistent sin and, here's the key, he shows no shame for the sin, no remorse, and he shows no hunger for the holy and the pure things of God. Church, I stand before you today and I say, I still sin. And I accept and I realize that it grieves the Holy Spirit. And I gather with you here in this place, and we read the word with depth and with purposeful intention to say, God, help us together to understand how to live as a fragrant aroma, to offer ourselves as a sacrifice that is pleasing to you. And together we live this way, and together we understand the dictates of God, and we love one another. We love. Do not partake. You love just the way you were loved. You forgive just the way you were forgiven. Because I love somebody doesn't mean I'm going to partake, condone, or agree with something that I know in my heart that I'm hungering to change. Or that you know in your heart that is sin. And it is very, very, very powerful, and it is monumental that you leave here today understanding you can be forgiven for all of your sins. God loves you and is forgiving you. And you can teach sin. You can educate people on sin and you can hunger for the pure things of God together with them and you can develop a hunger in people that need it. Amen? I would ask today in closing, do you understand that only the truth can set you free? Do you know that God loves you with divine love? Are you ready to leave and give up serving in the kingdom of darkness? To leave the kingdom of darkness behind and come into the kingdom of light. To be with Jesus. To serve with Jesus. Please turn to Christ. Receive forgiveness of all your sins. And begin a new life to be lived in the image of Jesus. As we close... I'll have Jane just start a two-minute piece of music for us to meditate. I'll speak into that for a minute now. I ask you, to agree with God in your heart that sin pains Him. As you sit here for these last minutes to leave refreshed, knowing you are forgiven. Refreshed, knowing that he loves every sinner that lives in this world that he has created, that the door is open for them and the door is open for you. We come before him humbly, as was said today, sinners in need of a Savior. If you haven't responded to the good news, I urge you and encourage you to do that today. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Come before him and be washed and cleansed, as the scripture says. And be recreated and begin living in his image. Please meditate on that. Be forgiven. In about a minute, Doug will come up and close us out. 
and we're going to have a baptism. Thank you, church. I remind you, we have a, a baptism uh, shortly. Uh, we'll have a give a chance to get ready, and then we'll do that. Uh, if you can stay, uh, baptism is intended for uh, demonstration for the church, and so I, I encourage you to do that if you can. I want to give you a few words. To end the service, and then we'll release. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for Anthony's words. We recognize that we are only human. We ask you, Lord, to be with us in every way. Ask us to rec help us recognize when we're going wrong. Ask us to give. Uh, your wisdom about how to change that. We pray, Lord, that you will be with us each and every step. We thank you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, we are released. Uh, we'll do the uh, uh, baptism here shortly. <laughs>